My name is Richard Green. I'm director of the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this morning's edition of Lusk Perspectives, which is about vulnerabilities in the mortgage market. And it is a real treat to be able to welcome the panel we have to talk to today because these are three people I got to work with closely during my uh, year in Washington, DC uh, in 2015, 2016. And they are all remarkably good at what they do. Um, our lineup is Lori Goodman uh, from the Urban Institute. She runs the housing, co-runs, I guess, the Housing Finance Policy Center there. Uh, lots of experience in the, wall, in the mortgage business, Wall Street, um, and then Urban Institute, uh, a font of knowledge on what's going on in the mortgage market. Uh, Ed Golding. Ed was the uh, commissioner of the Federal Housing Administration in roughly the last two years of the Obama administration. Before that, he ran financial research at Freddie Mac and strategy at Freddie Mac for a good long time. Uh, and I've known Ed for, gosh, it's got to be at least 20 years now uh, and always have enjoyed working with him. And then we're waiting on Ted Tozer um, from the Milken Institute. Oh, and by the way, uh, Ed is now, uh, runs a center uh, at MIT and is also affiliated with the Urban Institute. And uh, we will also be joined by Ted Tozer. Ted is currently with the Milken Institute and ran Ginny May for about seven years. Uh, and as, probably did more to teach me how uh, mortgage guarantees work than anyone else I've ever known. Uh, before I met Ted, I thought I knew how they work, uh, but it was only after working with Ted that I, I, maybe I should still say I only think I know how they work, but what I think I know is a lot more than I used to think I know. So we're gonna start with an overview from Lori Goodman, and what I'm going to do is share my screen and forward uh, advanced Lori slides as she tells me to do so. So Lori, thanks for being here. And Thanks please, very much for having me. And let me um, get my screen up and your PowerPoint up for you. So what I'm going to actually talk about, give you some overview on what the U.S. housing, residential housing market looks like, and then um, back one slide. Okay, this is perfect, perfect. And then talk about vulnerability, uh, talk about um, briefly about three vulnerabilities in the system, namely um, what's going on in the non-agency market, um, non-bank servicers, and then the tightening of the credit box. All three of those themes are going to be picked up by um, both Ed and Ted later. So this sort of gives you an overview of the, um, of the housing, of the, market size of the housing market, of the U.S. single family housing market. You can see it's about $31 trillion, of which 19.7 is household equity, and the word equity is missing, but it's household equity, and 11.2 trillion is debt. If you compare this to where we were in 2007, um, you can see that debt is not that much different. It's been pretty flat, whereas the amount of household equity is much, much higher. People are just much better uh, positioned coming into this crisis than we were going into the um, great financial crisis. Um, the right side of the page shows the composition of the U.S. housing market. You can see of that $11.2 trillion in debt, um, you, um, you can see 6.88 trillion is, um, is agency, that is Ginny, Fannie, and Freddie. 3.55 trillion is unsecuritized first liens in, um, is unsecuritized first liens in bank portfolios and in portfolios of other players, including Fannie and Freddie. About, um, half a tr about half a trillion apiece are um, home equity loans and private label securities. The next slide shows what origination volume has looked like. Um, you can see about 43% of 2019 volume was um, Fannie and Freddie. About 19% was um, Ginnie Mae. 
one point uh, two percent was private label and about 36 percent that back one slide don't worry about don't worry stay stay where you are it's not worth it and okay. about 36 percent was bank portfolio origination uh, so it just sort of gives you an idea of the government share um both um sort of in terms of stock and in terms of flow so the government share is sort of um roughly 60 to 70 percent of the market now let's look at what's happened recently. Um, this next slide um, shows you agency mm -hmm. MBS spreads. And so this is the spread between F the Fannie Mae current coupon and the 10 year treasury from um, 2004 to the present. So you can see um, there are two big spikes in spreads. The first was during the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and the second was very, very recently. Um, the right side of the page shows you what's happened very recently. And you can see there's a, there's a spike kind of, it looks like a two mountaintops. So if you, so basically the, so after that first, so basically after that, when that first mountaintop was reached, the Fed came in and said, we're, we're intervening. We're going to buy up to 200 billion in mortgages. So, so basically after the first mountaintop, the Fed said, we, you know, um, we're going to intervene and then uh, spreads came in and then they went right back out because the amount of the intervention that the Fed was proposing wasn't going to be nearly enough in the view of the market. Um, after the second intervention, the Fed said it will do whatever it needs to stabilize the market. At that point, spread stabilized and came in by a huge amount. You can see there was basically um, close to a 60 um, point, 60 basis point um, jump back in spreads. Now, obviously, this had some repercussions within the market in terms of, you know, specified pools traded very poorly because they were not guaranteed by the Fed. It made hedging very difficult because with this type of volatility, it's very difficult to hedge. But basically, when the Fed came in, they did a great job of stabilizing the agency part of the market. That is the 60 to 70 percent of the market, um, or the roughly um, the roughly 64 percent of what, or 62 percent of last year's production that was agencies. However, if we look at what's happened to the non-agency market, next slide, um, you can see that the jumbo market is tighter, and the non-qualified mortgage or or what's basically uh, the, most of the private label market is closed. So the MBA's mortgage accredited, the MBA does a mortgage accredited availability index each month. And what they look at is, um, is basically um, all regs, which is the lending guidelines for various entities. And the credit availability index for March fell 16% to the lowest level since 2015. The government index was down 6.6%. The conventional index was down 24.2%, and that's because the conforming index was down 2.7%, 2, 2 but the jumbo index was down almost 37%. So the real cutback was in jumbo credit, which was much, much tighter. Um, the non-QM loans, the non-qualified mortgage loans are loans to borrowers who have one of the following characteristics. Either they're self-employed, they rely on non-traditional documentation of income, such as bank statements. They have high debt to income ratios or they have lower credit scores. Now remember, these are loans that have, where the borrower has a lot of equity in the home. The average loan to value ratio on a non-qualified mortgage loan is about 70. Um, the, these loans, the market closed completely. The major lenders in this space aren't making loans. So Angel Oak and Citadel are two of the biggest lend are the two largest lenders in the space. They're they're completely and totally closed. Why are they completely and totally closed? They're completely and totally closed because these loans are trading. Um, we're trading as low as a price at about of about eighty four, and are now trading at a price of around ninety. That is, if you make a loan for a hundred dollars and you try to sell it immediately. At one point, you would have gotten as little as eighty-four as um, eighty-four dollars for that loan. Well, and you're still getting less than hundred dollars for that loan. So if you're going to sell, you you can't make it up in volume if you're if you're originating loans at a loss. 
So basically, the major lenders in this space are just not making loans at all. This market is totally and completely closed. Now, actually, there is a fairly um, easy policy solution here, and that is you can open TALF, which is the Federal Reserve's term asset-backed securities loan facility to AAA MBS. Currently, asset-backed securities, commercial uh, mortgage-backed securities, and CLOs of the highest credit rating are all covered by TALF but mortgage-backed securities are not, which is kind of interesting. Second big um, dislocation in the market um, next is, um, on, is, not, not, is the non-bank is the non-bank originator servicers. The non-bank servicers um, play a very, non-banks play a very important part of the market. If you look at this slide, you can see that they're about 86% um, of Ginnie Mae production they're about 60% of Fannie and Freddie um, production. And overall, they're about 69% of, of total production in the market. So non-bank okay. origination is really, really important. Non-banks um, non have to advance on their loans. That is, they have to continue to pay the investor. Um, and they don't actually have the cash to do it, even though they're going to even though they're going to be um, paid back for these advances. Ginny Mae has put into place a servicer facility um, to, to advance the principal and interest on the loans. The GSEs have limited the advances to four months. Um, even so, the Ginny um, advances don't cover the taxes and insurance um, payments, and they also don't cover the mortgage insurance premium, so the servicers do have advancing responsibilities, and it could be a um, so um, it, and it could be a long time before they're paid back. Um, I, Ed and Ted are both going to talk about this a lot more, but the point I want to make is actually on the next slide, and that's the why do we care? Um, and that is we care because the non-bank originators have a much wider credit box than their bank counterparts, especially for Ginnie Mae. So if you look at um, the top um, right slide, this shows you the median FICO scores for banks versus non-banks. Um, remember, banks are only about 14% of the Ginnie Mae market. They have much, much higher FICO scores than their non-bank counterparts. Um, they also, um, and in basically in both, um, in, there's lot, not much of a difference in the FICO scores between banks and non-banks um, among the GS, among GSE loans. However, uh, Non-banks are also more tolerant in the debt-to-income dimension as well. You can see they have a much wider credit box there um, in both um, um, in both Ginny and also in terms of Fannie and Freddie loans. That is, non-banks are more permissive um, in their lending. So, if the non-banks are not able to survive this, what it means is more is more credit tightening it will be very it'll be increasingly difficult for those who do not have pristine credit to get a mortgage next slide um, there's going to be much more credit tightening in the months ahead you have you haven't seen it now in terms of the you haven't seen it yet in terms of the aggregate levels although you have seen it in terms of what people's rules are for lending um, but one thing that we did see is because rate locks happen after mortgage applications. You haven't seen any, you haven't seen the aggregate data showing the shift in mortgage application volume, although it's clearly coming because everyone's tightening. But you have seen a shift in terms of lower quality lend, lower quality loans being charged higher rates, um, and particularly um, in non-banks. And you can see that very clearly um, on the top part of this slide. Um, but again, this is old news because these were rate locks that happened earlier. Um, there's no question that originators are tightening credit big time. Um, JP Morgan Chase has announced a minimum credit score of 700 and a minimum down payment of 20%, except for, except for um, refinancings to existing customers and some small amount of affordable lending. Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank have both hiked their minimum credit score to 680. Flagstar has hiked its minimum credit score to 640. 
Navy um, credit federal Navy Federal Credit Union has stopped offering FHA loans, and Better.com has stopped offering FHA loans. No jumbos above 80 LTV, and they've increased the minimum FICO score. So all of this points to increased tightening in the months ahead. Um, now, we know that there's been a severe pullback in terms of home purchase activity. Um, listings, Redfin shows, um, home, so shows their listings down 44%, pending home sales down 49%. MBA, Fannie, and Freddie all forecast refinancing activity to be much more important in 2020 than purchase activity. So on average, they see purchase activity down 10%, refi activity up 31%. And this is a huge change from their forecast in December and January, which had purchase activity up and refi activity down. Now you're probably thinking, oh, well, what, what, could, what, could, what could go wrong with refinancings? That's pretty straightforward. But even here, we're not prepared for the virus. So for example, um, here are some of the obstacles to refinancing. And a lot of loans are going really smoothly, but a lot of originators are, uh, have increasing piles of loans that can't be processed for one reason or another. And here are some of the obstacles. First, title searches can't be completed in areas that don't have computer searchable records as county assessor's offices are all closed. Verification of employment and confirmation of continuity of income is very, very difficult in this environment. Everyone's working remotely, records are, are sometimes not computerized and available, and confirmation of continuity of income is very important because if you're a lender, how, you know, how can you guarantee that, um, you know, that, that, that the borrower's income is going to continue and they won't be laid off tomorrow? Traditional appraisals can't be completed. Automated valuation models can be used, as can exterior only um, appraisals. But in some, but in many cases, um, you really do need a traditional appraisal in order to process the applications. And many states don't accept e-notarization. So these are just some of the obstacles to refinancing in this environment. Um, so uh, the, my task um, was to talk about vulnerabilities of the mortgage system. Check and I pass it back to Richard. Lori, thank you very much. Are you willing to share that? May I distribute these slides to the group? Um, yes. I, let me actually patch up two little things, which will take about an hour, and then you can and I'll, I'll mail it back to you. I'd like to correct a, a couple of my typos on the front page. Okay, very back. good. Okay, thank you, Lori. Um, one of the things you talked about is, and I don't know if you you want to share this or not, but on our call on Monday you showed, uh, you, your team did work on the impact of some of these tighter underwriting standards on the availability of credit, which is to say how many loans that were made in the past would not be made now. Could you share that with the group? Sure, unless, unless Ed was gonna cover that in his presentation. Ed, were you gonna talk about that? Go for it, no, no, go for it. Okay, so, so, we, um, so basically if you take out the affordable, if you take out um, sort of, so basically we use, JP Morgan Chase's criteria, and they are on you, they are by far the most stringent. But we figured that 64% of the loans would not have been made. Um, that that is, um, you know, you're only that is if you apply the criteria of, um, and we couldn't test for everything. That is, they had a DT, They that is, if you hike the credit score to 700 and assume a minimum down payment of 20%. Uh, but then you allow everything 97 and over um, as part of their affordable housing program, which is, which is perhaps a very generous definition, you find that 64% of the loans would not have been made, uh, which is just huge. Now, admittedly, J.P. Morgan Chase is the most stringent, but even so, there's going to be huge cutbacks in terms of what the credit box is going to be. Yeah, and, and this is, this is um, very scary because, again, it shows that lenders are being very pro-cyclical when we need them to be counter-cyclical, uh, especially right now. Uh, so it's, um, it's uh, th this is just yet another layer of worry for where we're going to be in the next several months. Uh, can I ask, has Ted Tozer joined us? You, you, we worked at, we're, 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 we're twins. There we go. Ted, good to hear your voice. <laughs> Ted is 
was such an extraordinary find for Ginny May that um, my understanding is that John Boehner, uh, the Republican Speaker of the House, recommended him to uh, the Obama administration and the Obama administration hired him. So Ted is a genuinely bipartisan certified uh, executive of Ginny May was for seven years. I can tell you, having seen it up close, what an extraordinary job he did as a leader of that organization, fixing many of the problems it had, alas, not fixing all of them because he was not permitted to. Um, and he was very prescient in talking about some of the problems that we would be seeing with servicers right now. And so it, it's particularly great to have Ted's insights at the moment. So Ted, please take it away. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Sorry for my, uh, my lack of technical skills, and I appreciate your patience. Um, Richard asked me to kind of talk about the plumbing a little bit, and I thought that we would talk about all the issues going on today with the issue around forbearance and a lot of discussions around uh, liquidity. I thought maybe to kind of walk you through understanding kind of the payments the borrower makes and where the money ends up going, you know, why this is such an issue. And basically, the, con the consumer makes um, their... Uh, their their uh, principal uh, component of their payment all goes to the investor. It will eventually go. It may go the month they pay it or it may go the following month. Interest portion of the payment is really interesting. The investor portion of their payment is less than their note rate because you have the uh, interest that belongs to the investor, which is the yield that the investor is uh, supposed to earn off the mortgage. But they also have the servicing fee, the amount of money the servicer receives to pay for the costs of their operation, hiring the staff, working with the customers and so forth, as well as the guarantee fee that you have to pay to Fannie Mae or um, Ginnie Mae out of this. So basically between 50 and 75% or 75 basis points of the borrower's interest uh, payment will go to guarantee fee and servicing and the residual will go to the investor. And then the last part of the payment the borrower makes every month is their a payment it goes into their uh, escrow account to pay tax insurance, um, you know, uh, mortgage insurance, uh, homeowners association dues, all those kind of fees that come out of their escrow account. So that's the makeup of really the payments that occur um, every month from the consumer. Uh, there are a lot of discussions in the last couple of days about FHFA working with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to cover the shortfall in principal interest payments that are due them to their bondholders as well as Ginny made me the same announcement a couple weeks ago. Uh, that's really kind of interesting um, situation we're in right now because really that, that uh, announcement is really somewhat, um, what can I say, a mental impact because of the fact that the way this, the uh, P&I payments are determined, the principal interest payments that go to the investor is determined every month is the fact that uh, every month end, the servicer sends a file, their month end file, that shows all their loan loans, what the current balance of loans is as, as a month end, and they use that to calculate their uh, P&I payment or principal payment they have to make for that coming month. So basically, for example, on March 31st, uh, servicers sent in their files to Fannie Mae and to Jenny Mae, and based on that, Fannie and Freddie uh, basically um, determine if the borrower just, just makes their minimum payment, their normal payment, what will the principal portion of that be? And what will the interest portion? And that's the amount that the servicer has got to pay for in Ginny May's world, it would be April 20th and Fannie Mae would be April 2018th. So basically any principal that comes in from the first, either the 18th for Fannie Mae or the 20th for Ginny Mae is actually what they call unscheduled principal, which means that they're not obligated to pay that for another month but that money goes into their principal interest uh, escrow account that's held for uh, the benefit of Fannie Mae or for Ginnie Mae. So when it comes time the 18th and 20th, basically Fannie Mae or Ginnie Mae looks at that principal interest account at the bank that, where they've been depositing the funds from the consumer and they say, is there enough money in there to cover the, um, uh, the money, money that's owed? And if there's not enough money, the servicer has to advance the difference. If there is uh, that much money or more, then they Fannie and Freddie just draft the, the amount they need out of that checking account. So what Fannie and Freddie were talking about doing is, if there was a shortfall, they would lend the money to the servicer. 
But in reality, that really hasn't become an issue because we have so much refinancing going on right now. Because based on some information that Black Knight put out, uh, for example, right now, for every loan in a uh, Fannie Mae pool that pays off, the amount of unscheduled principal that comes through that will cover the uh, principal interest payments for 198 loans that are delinquent. And for a Ginny May loan uh, pool, any, any uh, Ginny May loan that pays off will, will cover the principal interest for 203 loans. So, because again, the example I'm using is like, for example, if the, if the person's P&I payment, principal interest payment is $1,000, but the loan being paid off is 200,000, then you have all that extra money to cover it. So in reality, in today's world, servicers are telling me they have more than enough money coming in every month to make their principal interest payments, even though their delinquencies are increasing because of the, the amount of forbearance. So because of that, the, the Jenny May and Fannie and Freddie announcement is really uh, important if refinances slow dramatically or stop. But in today's world, it's really more of a, um, an academic type of a announcement. The biggest challenge we have is the, con the other parts that are not covered by Fannie and Freddie's announcement, that's the servicing fee. And uh, a lot of people have talked about uh, as much as 25% of the loans could be in forbearance. And under the CARES Act, the federal law that um, required forbearance could go up to just, could at least be six months, could be as long as a year. So to do some analysis on the servicing fees, what I found is that under using this information from Black Knight, that under the uh, Fannie Mae portfolio, the, the servicing fees that will, be, that will not be collected if we have 25% forbearance for six months is $1.7 billion. And the servicing fee for Jenny May that we've foregone is $1.2 billion. So basically almost $3 billion in servicing fees will not be collected if we don't have some way to get those servicing fees paid for uh, through some sort of a liquidity um, advance process where that money is covered because once the borrower makes their, their foreborn payments, the, those servicing fees will be uh, will accrue to the servicer. When it comes to guarantee fees, Fannie Mae requires the guarantee fee to be paid separately outside their monthly uh, you know, principal interest swoop that they do. And the same number there, based on what my calculations are, the amount of guarantee fee for Fannie Mae that the servicers have to come out of pocket for for that six month forbearance, um, 24% of their portfolio, will be $2.3 billion. And Jenny May charges a six basis point annual guarantee fee. And there's the same thing, it's charged outside their normal principal interest sweep, be $230 million. So be between the two of that, you're talking two and a half billion dollars in guarantee fees that'll, that'll have to uh, come out of the corporate uh, advances. And under taxes and insurance, you're in a situation where their escrow deposits for under the GSC side, that's approximately $41 billion. And on the Jenny May side, we approximately $22 billion with it, that is the amount of escrow deposits that would not happen. And the, and the large chunk of that would have to be advanced by the servicers because every month they have to pay uh, mortgage insurance if the loans are 80% uh, LTV on the conventional side. And for on the F, FHA loans, they have to pay 35 basis points worth of MIP to FHA, as well as whenever the property tax or homeowner insurance comes due. So the real challenge I think we have in today's world is how we deal with the servicing fee, the escrow deposits, and the guarantee fees. It's not the principal interest because we're in such a unique situation where refinances are still viable because of a situation where there's plenty of equity in people's homes and the vast majority of Americans are still working so they still, they still can do a, re, a refinance in today's historically low interest rates compared to 2008-9, where the refinances stopped as, as well as delinquencies going up, which was a toxic combination in 2008-9. Today, the uh, refinance and unscheduled principal balance is really bailing out the, the servicers when it comes to their uh, monthly p and accounts and what they have to pay for their p and to Fannie, Fannie Mae and to Jenny Mae. So that's kind of the challenges I see today when it comes to the plumbing and the liquidity that's out there that uh, in, especially independent mortgage bankers are facing in today's world. So tell me put you on the spot. If you're Mark Calabria, what do you do right now? 
Well, I mean, I, th I think that there, there, there's uh, a couple things that they could do. Um, first of all, again, he, he did the most obvious thing, what he did the other day, where he uh, allowed Fannie and Freddie to make, uh, lend the lender the shortfall for their P&I suite, even though in theory that's kind of not going to be that big a deal. The other issue is to have Fannie and Freddie do the same thing that FHA's authority to do is to do partial claims and actually accelerate the reimbursement because all these fees, all these advances for, uh, for the escrow account, all their um, monies for guarantee fees, all this, the, those fees will be reimbursed by, by Fannie and Freddie eventually. So the question is, can they accelerate that reimbursement so that literally that happens uh, uh, now versus six months or a year from now? Because normally what happens is once the forbearance period's over, six months or a year from now, and the borrower's gone to repay, Fannie and Freddie will usually reimburse the, um, uh, the servicers for all the forborn payments. So my question is, allow Fannie and Freddie to accelerate that reimbursement. So thank you, Ted. Um, so to sort of integrate everything we've heard to this point um, and hit on a few notes of his own, uh, let me turn it over to Ed Golding. As I said before, Ed was, uh, in charge of financial research and strategy at Freddie Mac for a very long time um, and has since moved on to MIT and the Urban Institute, uh, has taught at Columbia, has taught at Princeton, uh, and again, has probably as deep a knowledge of mortgages as anybody in the world. So Ed, thanks for being here. Right. Thank you. Uh, you proved I can't hold a job. Uh, on that. And so it's good to see my friend uh, Ted, even if he's using my name uh, uh, on that. Let me just cover three things quickly. I want to talk a little bit more about the single family market and with a little focus on FHA. I do want to talk about the rental market. We forget, well, most of you don't, but many of us forget that one third of the households are renters. And uh, in fact, our hardest hit in this uh, uh, pandemic for a variety of reasons but then sort of look forward on to the economy and sort of see what we need to do to get everything restarted as quickly as possible um, on that. So you heard from both Lori and Ted about, uh, you know, sort of the pipes and the forbearance programs. Let me sort of back up to 2008. And if we learned one lesson, was that lowering people's payments on their mortgage is the most effective way of keeping people in the house. Um, we lost, uh, five, there were about 5 million foreclosures in the Great Recession. I think many of them, most of them probably could have been avoided if we had acted faster on that. We were very slow to react and it was very hard to get a refi, uh, a relief refi. It was very hard to get a modification. And what we've done this time with the forbearance is almost make it just a click and that uh, you can then get a forbearance um, very easily if you just basically say you've been affected by the pandemic. Uh, very little documentation. We already see the uptake um, uh, on the Ginny May FHA VA side, uh, close to 10%. I think a lot of forecasts say that about 30% uh, borrowers will take some advantage of that. That's roughly 3 million borrowers on the FHA VA side. And on the GSE side, the numbers are, you know, a third to a half of that. We have about 5%. We've already taken up forbearance. It probably will go up, you know, to about 10%. But it's getting that, it's basically just an interest-free loan uh, to the borrowers to help them out during this crisis. And that makes a lot of sense because the Fed has basically pushed interest rates to zero. And what better mechanism than the mortgage market to be able to transmit those 0% interest rates to the homeowner? They still basically, it's an interest-free loan. Uh, and what happens at the end of the forbearance, whether you pay it back right away, whether you get five years, whether you get the life of the loan, uh, will be determined by the individual circumstance. But it was very important to get people uh, who might need the, those funds a reduction very quickly. Um, it has definitely you know, created problems in the mortgage market. 
uh, that Ted has talked about because there are folks that need to advance the funds. And in many ways, the system is set up, uh, whether it's Ginny May, FHA, uh, VA, or the GSEs, those funds can be advanced. And I think the other lesson that we, I think, learned last time, but is not being done as clearly as it could have been, is when you're addressing financial crises, it really should have been important to get a lot of confidence and a lot of certainty into the system. And I think the one thing I'd fault uh, FHFA and maybe others for is sort of dripping out. They will eventually solve the problem, but they've made the market very uncertain about how quickly or how they're gonna solve it. And um, it's sort of the advancing of the funds that uh, Ted talked about. So I think uh, making sure we avoid foreclosures are very important. Uh, the forbearance plan is a way of doing that. We really need to provide more certainty as to who's going to pay when that uh, Ted talked about. Let me switch quickly uh, to the rental market because you know, this one's a little bit more problematic. Um, and people have studied this, and I think Lori will chime in because uh, Urban, I know, has done some of it. But many of the people hit by unemployment in the crisis for a variety of reasons tend to the, be the people who are more likely to be renters. And the question is, how do we help them? We do not want to be evicting people uh, during this period of uh, the, the crisis. And so obviously one way of helping people who are unemployed is just extending unemployment insurance. And we've done that at least through July, an extra $600. But there's a lot of talk about how to provide rental relief uh, beyond that. Uh, the CARES Act did a small amount of eviction protection. If you have a federal mortgage, that means sort of a multifamily FHA or GSE mortgage. There's, I think, 60, 90 days of eviction protection uh, built into the CARES Act. But there has been a lot of talk now in uh, basically passing legislation that will provide additional assistance uh, to renters. And I think there's a real divide on how to do it. Do you try to provide the money directly in the form of rent uh, vouchers, for example, to the tenants? Or do you uh, basically, as we've done for small businesses, do you try to pass the money on uh, to the owners of the properties and basically make up for their lost rent when people aren't being able to pay rent? And so while we attacked uh, the system on the owner side, uh, you know, on the uh, homeowner side, where a lot of the pipes already existed through FHA, Ginny May, GSEs, uh, unfortunately, the pipes don't exist to get money as easily uh, to the renters or to the owners of the properties. And I think there is discussion of how to further uh, provide aid to that. Let me just sort of wrap up uh, with sort of what's the effect uh, on the economy. When uh, we, you know, when the pandemic passes, um, how quickly will the economy come back? And here's one where uh, I think I'll reiterate some of the data that uh, Laurie showed you. You see, you see a very pro-cyclical mortgage market right now with people pulling back on credit. And the real question I have is how fast is that gonna be reversed? Are all those overlays that are in the mortgage market, are they gonna be lifted as quickly as they were put in place? And you know, in many ways, we have developed a mortgage system that has become more pro-cyclical over time. Uh, back when I started uh, in the mortgage business many years ago, uh, if you asked anyone what's the capital requirement for mortgages, they would, give, they would rattle off one or two leverage ratios. Uh, we now have very sort of risk-based capital that encourages when risk goes up, people to pull back more. And I really worry that the mortgage market that we've set up uh, that Laurie and Ted have talked about are not gonna loosen very quickly and we will see very tight credit and that will spill over to lower construction, uh, fewer mortgages and basically a, a real break on the economy uh, coming back quickly. So 
something that uh, policymakers will really need to focus on. How do we get credit started again? The question, you know, it, it may not be that light switch uh, back on either. And that is of concern. And I see Laurie wanting to chime in. So I will leave it with that. Uh, Richard or Laurie? So Laurie, go ahead. Um, no, I was actually just going to pick up on one of Ed's themes, if you don't mind, and that was on the renter side. Um, you know, as Ed mentioned, the pipes were in place to do more on the homeowner side, and they have with um, basically forbearance pretty much available for the asking. Um, it's sort of interesting that we've done a lot less for renters. That is, um, the CARES Act um, for some re for some renters gives um, for gives um, a certain amount of eviction protection, but it doesn't pay the rent. Uh, and there are no provisions to pay the rent or forgive the rent or whatever. And it's important to realize that, you know, there are 78 million homeowners. They have an annual income of $78,000 on average. There are, um, uh, there are about 44 million renters. They have um, an annual income of $41,000. So just to, you know, so we've done um, less, for and their their unemployment rate is high. The unemployment rate of renters is higher to begin with, and many more of them are in industries, particularly service industries, that are affected by COVID nineteen. So I just you know I sort of wanted to just reiterate Ed's point there. Yeah, and and um, the estimates I've seen is the cost of providing rental assistance so that people basically would be in the same position they were before, which is to say they pay no more of their current income than they paid of their past income would be about seven, eight billion dollars a month. And, uh, you know, until two months ago, people would have said that's a lot of money. But now in this world, that feels like uh, not all that much money. And it would be very helpful to the landlords as well and to the lenders, because if people get rental assistance, then they'll pay their rent. And if they can pay their rent, then the landlords can pay their mortgages. And it, and it makes the whole chain work better. And I, I was just doing a back of the envelope. If you think about six months of forgiven interest on about $7 trillion of loans, let's say that's a 4% annual rate on average of the loans outstanding. That's 20, if I'm getting my orders of magnitude right, Ed, that's 28 billion a year. So that's 14 billion over the six months of relief that people are getting. And, and by the way, I, I think this is absolutely the right thing to do, but um, we might want to think about the magnitude of that relative to the magnitude of what we're giving yeah. in the rental market. Right? It, forbearance is not forgiveness. So the question is how much of that will be paid back? I think of No, no, I, I, I understand that. It, but, but, loan. But, but as you said, they're, they're interest-free loans. And so I'm, what I'm getting at is not paying interest for three months or six months, that's a subsidy. Yes. And I'm not complaining, but don't think, I'm not complaining about it being, I, I'm glad it's there, but that is, you know, multiply the mortgage debt outstanding by the interest people aren't paying, you know, that's real money too. Um, let me ask, you know, an issue none of you have brought up that sometimes people mention to me, and, and uh, again, on our urban call on Monday morning, it was brought up, was the issue of moral hazard people taking advantage of these programs that don't really need to take advantage of them. Let me ask any of the three of you, how worried, if at all, are you about that as a problem? I, I'm not worried that much about it, especially with the consumer perspective, because this is a, Ted, because the thing that I, I saw was really interesting was I was talking to a major servicer and he was telling me that uh, basically 10% of their loans are in forbearance now uh, under the CARES Act. But the interesting about it, out of that 10%, 2% or 2% of the loans uh, overall in the portfolio, they're still making their payments on. So it's almost like the consumer wants to make the payments if they can. But they're trying to get ahead of the game by getting all the paperwork set up and so forth. So if they need the forbearance, it's there. But to me, I thought it was really uh, unusual. And this person told me the same thing that people are actually coming and, and making their payments, even though they, they could very well forbear, uh, forbear their payments, they're not doing it. So to me, I think the average consumer wants to make their payment um, if they can. It's only if they can't do it that they're not gonna make their payments. So to me, I think the chances of having um, moral hazard from the consumer perspective, I think is somewhat minimal. 
I think one thing we learned from the 2007, 2008 experience is that um, if you try to combat moral hazards, you end up putting a lot of rules in place in terms of documentation and all that. It takes much, much longer and you end up being very delayed in getting help to the people that need it the most. And that cost is far, far greater than the small amount of moral hazard that might be introduced to the system. And Richard, I know uh, you know this very well, but you know the term moral hazard is sometimes not that well defined. I mean, in the last crisis, you could point to people buying their you know, third home that shouldn't have bought the third home. And so there was an activity that people, you, if you had, mon could, you should have monitored it and you should have you know, restricted the activity. I can't, you know, there, isn't, there may be some transfers to people who you think, you know, aren't the most needy in this, but it's very hard for me to actually see technically where anything that even borders on moral hazard is. Yeah. I mean, the income distribution at the end of this, you know, maybe you, you may look at it and say, you know, why did Harvard get money or so? even though it was legal, did Harvard commit moral hazard by taking the provisions of the act? Um, you know, we can debate whether the act was appropriate, but I wouldn't, you know, no one is saying Harvard conducted, you know, did something that, you know, lacked morals or was a moral hazard in that. Um, on that. So I don't even like the term uh, on here. I don't see people doing things that they shouldn't do. Well, I mean, this is one of these rare instances where we really have had an exogenous event. Is people are in trouble not because they did something wrong. It's because sort of, well, a disease struck. And I even think about, so services we were talking about earlier are a group for whom I often don't have all that much sympathy. But when the government mandates that you forbear, uh, that means that you're being mandated not to collect income that you ordinarily would be collected. And so to do one thing, to mandate such a thing without some provision on the other side seems ir on its own irresponsible. It's not that people are deciding not to go to work, which is why I find some of the debate over current levels of unemployment insurance a little silly. It's that they're being told they have to stay home. So, it, and, and yeah, I mean, I'm sure that people can find specific examples of people taking advantage when they shouldn't be taking advantage, but it all seems not even second order, but third order to me at this point, um, which is I'm glad why all three of you agree with me on that point, but I did not stack the panel for that reason. We do have a question from the audience. Um, this comes from Frank Bird. How do you see the impact of this crisis with regards to homeowners versus renting playing out regionally? Do the more expensive coastal urban areas struggle longer than the middle Amer America as the economy evolves to its new reality? Yes, I do think, um, you know, we do see, um, you know, the areas that are hardest hit by this, which in many cases were already, um, already hard hit by the salt taxes. So, you know, you sort of think about um, California, you think about New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, all of which have been hard hit by both, by both things. Um, and you were already, I mean, those were already states that were experiencing um, exoduses in terms of... Um, and Laurie, let me uh, emphasize, that, have it, that was true before the salt act. Yes, you were already seeing exoduses. I think that was accentuated after the SALT Act, particularly, you know, in the Northeast. You were already um, seeing net outward migra the net outward migration rate accelerated, particularly for those that were um, more affluent. And then the result was that you were ending, you were, um, had, you were already experiencing fairly large home price declines in places like Connecticut, parts of New Jersey, even before this. And I think this definitely changes the dynamic about living in sort of the large super cities, actually. Um, Richard, and, I might just add, yeah. you know, the other thing that uh, California and New York in particular always had people leaving it, or not always, but recently, and had a big infill from migration um, on that. We've cut from off- foreign you know, migration. The foreign. migration, immigration, migration, uh, has changed dramatically, and I think we haven't figured out 
uh, whether that's you know, how permanent is it over multiple administrations and what will that affect? Because the, pop the innate population growth in this country is basically zero if we don't bring immigrants in. So let me, so there's a specific question for, for Lori and then, then we're gonna have to wrap up because um, I have to go to a faculty meeting. Uh, it's from Michael Banner. And what Michael asks is about the historic disparate access to mortgage lending for ethnic borrowers being a, um, a barrier to wealth building. Um, what policy recommendations would you prescribe going forward to minimize the, this being accentuated in the next years? Yeah, so I mean, this is something I worry about a lot, and I agree. I mean, sort of owning your home is sort of is the best single way to build wealth. Um, and so I guess, um, you know, we were very slow, you know, obviously credit was way too loose in 2007, 2008. It had gotten way, it got way too tight and it loosened marginally, but it was still too tight. And what I worry about is every single thing, we, everything that's coming out of this crisis is going to make it even, um, tighter. Um, uh, so, you know, FHA is a critical channel for, um, lower income and minority borrowers. Some of the actions that are being talked about there, like um, limiting the use of government um, down payment assistance are just scary. And I'm not aware of any evidence that really shows that loans with government down payment assistance perform any worse than loans with you know, family down payment assistance. Um, and obviously minority borrowers are less, less able to um, Access family wealth, so leaving that down payment so leaving that down payment assistance channel open, and in fact, opening it even more, I think is really critical. Second thing, I think you, you should be you should be doing is um, sort of thinking more broadly about credit scores because your biggest the biggest expenditure each month for someone who rents is their rent. That rent is not normally picked up by the credit bureau, so it doesn't count toward your credit score. Obviously, the rent bureaus pick it up. They count it, but they have like less than 1% of um, the rents covered. If you don't pay your rent and you're, paid, you're, taught, you're turned over to a collection agency, then it's counted negatively. But sort of accessing bank statements and counting rent payments um, towards one's credit, I think, could be... Um, very, very powerful. And then finally, sort of looking at bank statements to count gig income, um, because a lot of times uh, minority borrowers have two or even three jobs to try to keep that, to keep the income flowing. And we're not picking that up in sort of our standard measures of income. So sort of, so, so looking at bank statements um, more broadly to assess capacity to repay, I think is really important. Let me, Richard, very quickly, I'd go one step further. I mean, just like we did a GI Bill after um, we, after World War II that benefited my father tremendously and put him on the road to home ownership. Uh, there are a lot of the first line people in this, uh, in this, uh, in, this epi in this pandemic, you know, whether it's the transit workers or the nurses or, or the like, and we know be, by infection rates, a lot of those tend to be communities of color who have been on the front line. Uh, why not sort of extend uh, a, a down payment assistance type program to all the people who helped battle this uh, virus? And in many ways, I think that would help uh, on home ownership rate in a lot of these communities. And so I absolutely agree with Lori. We should not do any harm, and we are doing harm. But I think we should go a step further and really uh, address the issue head on. And I think it's worth noting here is the VA loan program has been for years the safest loan program out there. It is a 0% down payment program. And through the global financial crisis, VA loans performed better than any other kinds of loans. Now they're very well underwritten, but it shows that you can make a zero down payment product a very successful product. And with that, we're past the top of the hour, so I have to let people go. Ted, Ed, and Lori, again, thank you very much for giving us an hour here today. Always great to see the three of you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming.